Okay, so our next section is the vascular lung disorders. With this one and the expansion disorders, you're kind of getting into some um, pretty cool stuff that's occurring. Um, this is more of your emergency medicine. Um, it's kind of occurring things that you would find maybe in the ER, things like that. Um, so these, these tend to be a little more exciting than your chronic uh, disorders. So our first one we're going to talk about is pulmonary edema. We have a little drowning victim over here, and we'll talk about why that is with pulmonary edema in just a second. Okay, so we have fluid that's collecting within um, the alveoli of the lung tissue, and this is where gas exchange is supposed to be happening. Uh, so we don't want fluid in there because that's going to kind of disrupt things. So with this disorder, we do have fluid that's there. Okay, so this is going to reduce the amount of oxygen that we can get in and out of the blood. Um, which is not going to be good. Okay, so low oxygen levels within the blood is going to happen. Obviously, if we're not able to do that exchange like we should, and sometimes the expansion of the lungs is going to become difficult um, because of this fluid ac accumulation, and that is going to lead to collapse of lung. Okay, that can be a portion that can be a major chunk, so we just kind of want to look at that. Okay. The pressure that is happening within the lungs because of this fluid is going to lead to our capillaries rupturing, and we will see that as one of our signs and symptoms of them kind of coughing up um, blood-tinged sputum. Okay. So three reasons why this might occur. We have inflammation within the lungs that's going to have um, a lot of fluid in the area. We've talked about before with inflammation that we have a lot of swelling and that is where plasma and white blood cells are going to be leaving the vascular system to come into the tissues to help with the area of, of need. So if we have any inflammation in the area, that's going to lead to that plasma leaking into our lung tissue, which is going to cause problems. Okay. We can also talk about a fluid shift. So proteins are going to keep the plasma fluid within our vascular system where it's where it should belong okay but if our, our protein levels are low then the plasma will leak out going into the tissues and we will have what's called a fluid shift and that is what is occurring within the lungs okay or pulmonary hypertension can also lead to this so again high blood pressure of the circulatory system within the lungs Okay, so there's different conditions that can lead to pulmonary edema. Usually you're, you're not just going to suddenly wake up and have pulmonary edema. So there's usually different things that are going to kind of be causing this. So things like left-sided congestive heart failure. So with left-sided heart failure, again, the back, the problem is occurring with our um, systemic circulation is backing everything up and that is going to back up fluid within the lung tissue and it's going to create high blood pressure within um, that circulation as well. Okay, With the hypoprotein, um, proteinema is going to be um, low protein levels within the blood and that can be happening with our kidney or liver disorders. Again, inflammation of the lung is going to increase the capillary permeability which is going to lead to lots of fluid accumulating in the lungs and again, we can have pulmonary hypertension occurring uh, for other things other than just the left-sided heart failure. So signs and symptoms of this um, depends on how severe it is. So with mild cases, they're going to have things like a cough or sopnia when they start uh, laying back laying more in a flat position, that they have more of a difficulty time breathing. So they do like to, to sleep um, or always be sitting up slightly um, for any reason because otherwise they kind of feel like they're, they can't breathe as well, okay? They will also have rails, which is the crackles that can occur within the lungs. So you're gonna hear that when you auscultate or use the stethoscope on them, okay? With our moderate pulmonary edema, we have things like hemoptysis, which is the coughing up of blood. Again, that is from the capillaries that are rupturing underneath the pressure uh, that's occurring within the, the lungs. So we're talking about this pulmonary hypertension, pressures become too great, capillaries start bursting, and when they're coughing up 
um, all the all the coughing that they're doing to help expand their lungs, then um, a little bit of blood's going to come out as well. Okay, because of the different chemicals that are kind of located within our lungs to keep them inflated, there's a thing called surfactant that's in there that keeps them in. Um, inflated really well. When that mixes with all the plasma fluid, it becomes this kind of frothy, bubbly material. So when they are coughing up fluid, um, it can be very frothy, almost like uh, when you think about like somebody who, or an animal or whatever that has rabies and they're kind of foaming from the mouth, it's going to look a little bit like that. They're obviously going to have trouble breathing. Okay, with their more severe Pulmonary edema cases, they do feel like they're drowning, which is why we have our little drowning with them up here. Okay. Uh, oxygen levels within their blood is going to be very low, and they will be a little on the blue side. Um, they can also develop acute uh, congestive heart failure from all of this happening. So that's going to um, kind of affect how everything is functioning as well. Okay, so treatment options for them. Uh, so we want to treat whatever caused the pulmonary edema to begin with. So whatever, whatever kind of got all of this going, we want to treat that and then hopefully everything will kind of correct itself. So supportive therapy such as oxygen is going to be very good for these individuals. Okay, severe cases, we're going to use positive pressure mechanical ventilation. We'll talk about that in just a second. Um, and then um, with all of this fluid that's in the lungs, their risk for pneumonia is very, very high. Okay. So again, risk for infection is huge for them. Okay. And we want to keep their head of their bed elevated so they don't feel like they're having such trouble breathing. So we want it at least higher than 30, 30 degrees. So I'll show you a picture of that. So this is a positive pressure mechanical ventilation. You may be familiar with CPAP or BiPAP and that's um, this positive pressure. So when they go to breathe in, um, the machine is going to recognize that and it's going to force air into their lungs. Okay, so That's going to get oxygen where it needs to be. Even if it doesn't want to go there, it's going to kind of force it in through there. Um, you see this a lot with uh, individuals that have sleep apnea, but we can also use this in things like pulmonary edema as well to help oxygenate our patients. Because just putting them on a simple mask or nasal cannula is not going to get the oxygen where it needs to be. Okay, so here's an example of degrees of the head of the bed. So 30 is kind of right in here. 45 is in between 90 and flat. And again, we just want to have them anywhere higher than 30, and that's going to make it easier for them to breathe. Now, 90 does not look like a comfortable position to be sleeping in, but anywhere between 30 and 90 um, is going to be good for them. So you may notice that they sleep in uh, like recliners and things like that where they're more upright than they would be in a bed. Okay, so our next one is pulmonary embolism, commonly referred to as BEs. Okay, so this is a blood clot that is happening within our pulmonary arteries. And you've got to remember where your pulmonary arteries are. So we have just left the lungs. I mean, we have just left the heart, excuse me. Just left the heart, we are going to the lungs. Okay, so those are the pulmonary arteries there, and that is where a blood clot is wedging itself in. Okay, and that is going to block the flow of blood, which means we are not getting blood to the lungs like we should, which means there is no gas exchange going on, and then there's really nothing returning back to the heart to get pumped out into general circulation. So that is also going to affect all kinds of other things. So we will see that we have many problems with, with PEs, okay? Most of these guys are developing from deep vein thromboses, which are blood clots that are occurring um, in a major vein within the body. Most of the time is gonna be leg related. So somebody's getting a uh, blood clot within their leg and then it shifts, goes to the heart, doesn't get, it doesn't get stuck in the heart anywhere. The first place it does get stuck is in this pulmonary artery. Okay. So DVTs are a leading cause of death within hospitals, and we try to um, kind of keep that at 
uh, under control by giving our patients um, any type of heparin type shot. Uh, sometimes they will do heparin, but uh, the hospital I used to work at, we did Lovenox shots with the, in the belly. So this was a like a insulin syringe, so a very short needle, very tiny um, aroundness of it. But you would every 24 hours get a Lovenox shot, and it would prevent you from getting a blood clot, and therefore keep you alive in the hospital. Okay, so 600,000 people every year are diagnosed with one of these, whereas we have 60,000 deaths from this, usually within the first hour of it developing. Okay, so not only is it a major, the leading cause of death within the hospitals kills 10% of the patients who actually get PEs. It's a very quick death as well. So even if you are in the hospital, we recognize the symptoms, we try to treat you. Sometimes we're not gonna be able to save you for now, okay? So it's better to say, yes, I got a shot in the belly with Lovenox than to be one of those 60,000 people, okay? Um, so, PEs, as far as how severe they are, is going to be dependent on how big they are, okay, and where exactly they're located. Have we blocked off the entire pulmonary artery? Is it a branch? Is it a small branch? Is it a bigger branch? Um, kind of what's going on. So, if we have smaller PEs that are occurring. For the most part, they're asymptomatic, meaning we're not going to have any signs of them. But if we have lots of small ones, it's going to kind of basically equal a large one. Okay, with moderate sized ones, we are going to start impeding how well our blood is flowing through the area, which is going to lead to some major signs and symptoms. But with our very, very large um, emboli, we have lots of issues that are going on. So this means that more than 60% of our lung tissue has been affected by this particular blood clot. And that is not just going to wreak havoc on our respiratory system, but our cardiovascular system as well. Okay, so this can lead to acute um, right-sided congestive heart failure. It is definitely going to de decrease the amount of um, blood that we're actually pushing out of the heart. Because again, there's not a lot of blood that's returning back from the lungs because it can't ever get there. So cardiac output is gonna go down and therefore um, organs are gonna start shutting down and the, the individual is gonna go into shock. Okay. Again, 90% of the PEs are originating from those DVTs that we talked about earlier. And again, most of them are coming from the legs. Okay. So how do you prevent getting one of these deep vein thromboses? Okay, so different risk factors that we have. Uh, we have immobility, so patients that are not able to get up and do a lot of moving around um, is going to greatly affect them. So anytime we have blood that's pooling and sitting still, it always clots, okay? So we wanna keep these individuals moving or there's a couple other techniques that we'll talk about um, in just a second that is going to prevent um, some of this with our patients that actually cannot physically get up and move, okay? So things like trauma and surgery, especially to the legs can happen. Um, if we have surgery in the area, again, blood clots are gonna be developing. Um, so that's gonna put them at risk for that, okay? Uh, pregnant women and the process of childbirth can also lead to this. There can be a blood clot that develops within um, the placenta and the amniotic um, Sorry, the umbilical cord, um, amniotic fluid can develop um, clots. Um, and again, placenta can kind of have all, all these different things kind of coming together that can cause blood clots um, and can be life threatening for mom. Okay. Uh, congestive heart failure can do the same thing, dehydration. And then we have increased coagulability of the blood. So blood is clotting way too easily. Again, it's going to lead to clots forming everywhere, and then again, one of them can travel to the pulmonary artery and cause all kinds of problems. Okay. With immobility, I do want to kind of jump back to this for just a second. Um, with immobility, not just our patients that aren't moving, but like 
or patients who have recently had surgery and they don't want to move. Okay, that can lead to them being immobile for a little bit. You can even talk about somebody who's taken a long international flight. If they don't get up and move during the flight at some point, all of that sitting around, they could possibly develop a thrombosis, especially if they have a problem with this co uh, coagulability already, then um, that will lead them to also developing a DVT, which could turn into a PE, okay? and things like cancer. Um, PEs don't always have to be blood clots. It can be fat that is roaming around uh, within the bloodstream or any other type of material. Okay, So we can have a fat emboli from a fracture of a large bone, usually her femur. Um, we can have vegetations that are coming off of from endocarditis and then tumors that can actually break off and flow through the bloodstream, wedge into those pulmonary arteries and cause a PE as well. So signs and symptoms, so for our smaller PEs, we're gonna have things like chest pain and cough, and they're gonna be a little bit of shorter breath or it can be having trouble breathing, um, but for the most part, they're gonna be asymptomatic. With our larger ones, they're gonna have sudden dyspnea, so they're gonna be breathing just fine, and then all of a sudden, having difficulty breathing. So almost, I don't wanna compare it to anxiety attack, but how suddenly that comes on, that's about how sudden their dyspnea is gonna come on as well, okay? And then with our massive PEs, severe, severe chest pain, um, and it is going to affect uh, cardiac output extremely quickly. So blood pressure is gonna drop, pulse is going to increase, um, they're going to lose consciousness, and if nothing is done, they will die very quickly, okay? So different ways we can treat this. Compression stockings for our immobile, immobile patients. So compression stockings are going to squeeze their legs and that is gonna help with um, circulation to keep things moving so that we don't have anything that's sitting still and causing those clots. We can also talk about TED hose and TED hose are going to gently massage the legs to also increase um, circulation within the legs to prevent blood clots as well. Um, oxygen therapy. So if we do find out that they do have a PE, then um, oxygenation is going to be kind of our uh, number one thing that we're going to want to look at for them. Okay. If we also know that they already have a PE, we're going to give them things like heparin or streptokinase, which is going to break down that clot to reverse the effects. Okay. So explain how a PE can cause immediate death. To think on this one for a second. Okay, first you have to ask yourself what is going on with the PE? So we're talking about a blood clot. Okay, so we have blocked the flow of blood into the pulmonary artery, which is not going to get blood into our lungs for gas exchange to happen. And if the blood doesn't get there, then it is not going to return back to the heart. And if it doesn't return back to the heart, it is not going to get pumped out to general circulation. If it does not do that, your body is going to go into shock and you will die. Okay. So we, again, we, we have stopped the flow of blood in a major location where everything has to go through. So yes, immediate death. Okay. And we will look at expansion disorders in our next video.